Uh, so, today we're going to continue to talk about the bottom million. And um, you need, need to make sure to get the book if you haven't got it. And you need to make sure to read it. And there's uh, discussion questions that are on your UEL Plus site. And you should go through those because those are going to be important for preparing for your final exam as well. Okay? So, you're, you're going to be revisiting the material. Um, as, as we go along. The other thing is for next week, because we're going to start talking about technology and growth, and I'm going to put up uh, two case studies for you, but you need to do the reading. So you have a couple chapters in Global Shift that you need to have read, and also a chapter in Easterland. And, uh, and then uh, I want you to go through the questions and look at the case studies, and the case studies will, will deal with uh, technology and, and growth. Okay, and then I'm going to be putting up uh, three other articles today that I'll be mentioning to you in the lecture. And they're just uh, extra reading to give you more depth on uh, the whole idea of some of the things that we're going to discuss in the lecture today. Okay, so they're, they're touched on in uh, the bottom billion, but they're uh, a little more in depth in terms of giving you some more depth of understanding. All right, so again, uh, There'll be three three articles that I'll put up. One by Simon Kuznets on uh, you know the whole idea of structural adjustment. Uh, one by Dollar and Cray. It's, these are also classic articles uh, that's on uh, growth is good for the poor. Okay, that w was very controversial that came out through the World Bank. And then the third one is by the guy who wrote the Bottom Billion and um, someone at Oxford. And it's about um, grief and grievances. And it's a, a fascinating piece to read because they, they do an analysis, a statistical analysis of why civil wars take place. Okay? So, um, so again, make sure to uh, take a look at all those articles. All right, so what we're going to do today in, in terms of the lecture is look at this book and a number of the topics that are uh, brought out in the book in terms of really thinking about why we still have a billion people that seem to be left behind and why, you know, we have places, you know, as we talked last time, like China and India that seem to be moving ahead. Um, the majority of the world is actually moving ahead. I mean, they're, they're the, the people that have been lifted out of poverty and the change. Now, we'll talk later on, there's a lot of income distribution issues. But there still remains this kind of stubborn bottom and a number of countries that actually we see, just as we did in the 19th century, we saw a divergence. We saw uh, Europe and places like the United States, particularly at the turn of the 20th century, go through the Industrial Revolution and really pull themselves up while other countries stagnated. And uh, now we're starting to see much more of convergence, but we still got this large group that seems to be left behind. And in fact, they're getting poor. Okay? And, and so the question is, why is it? What's going on here? Why, why, don't they, why are they not able to absorb the technology change? Uh, you know, why, why do they continue to uh, have poor governance? Um, and what is the role of really the international community and uh, aid organizations in terms of fostering growth in these uh, other places in the world. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting uh, dilemma. And um, so one of the things that I'm going to do towards the end, after we talk a little more in, in general about some of these topics, is bring in some of my own research um, and a, a case study from Yemen. Because Yemen's a very interesting country, and it's part of the, what they call the Africa Plus, and we'll, we'll talk about what makes up those countries. And um, because most of these countries in this bottom billion are in Africa, by the way. And uh, so, but when we look at this kind of Africa plus, Yemen is one of these countries. And, you know, I, I started doing research in Yemen in the late 1980s. And the first time I went to Yemen, you know, I, I felt like sometimes I was in a movie because, you know, I'd be walking down a street and, you know, people would be dressed in in, you know, ways that I would associate more with like the 18th century, um, heavily armed by the way, you know, often 
you know, because it was really uh, not strong central government. And, um, and then, you know, the, the level of poverty w was extreme. Um, and, you know, I would see people working out in the fields, you know, women literally breaking the ground with uh, a rope with a, a stone tied to it, you know, because they had no other means of, of, of you know, plowing. So, very, very primitive. And, you know, you're talking the late 1980s. And, you know, people who had really uh, very little access to media. You know, uh, one of the things that fascinated me about doing research in Yemen was when I first started going there, uh, you know, most places an American goes in the world, people either love you, they hate you, they're very rarely indifferent about you, but they know who you are, okay? So pe people tend to have impressions of America, you know, and, and opinions about Americans, because Americans are, are, are seen as very visible, and they, they played a significant role in, in the, uh, you know, economy, particularly in the 20th century. So, but when I went to Yemen, Yemenis had no idea what an American looked like, you know, and so, uh, you know, it was fascinating for me, because I, you know, I'd, I'd go to a village, and maybe these villagers had heard about some Chinese people that were building a road. Now, you, you can look at me and know I'm not Chinese, all right? But for a Yemeni who had never seen someone from China before, and we're talking late 1980s, they would look at me and they'd ask me, are you Chinese? Okay? You know, why? Because they heard that some Ch people from China. And, you know, so, so this was really fascinating for me as an American to go to a place and, and uh, it really intrigued me about, about Yemen and, and, and the Yemenis. And, uh, you know, it was also, you know, just towards the end of the Cold War, and parts of Yemen were very aligned with the former Soviet Union. So there was, you know, a, a lot of people would speak uh, Russian. No one spoke English, you know. So it was very good because I, I was at the time learning Arabic, so my Arabic, of course, got very good because if anyone in this room who's not a native English speaker knows, when you go into a place where you can't use your native language, you learn very quickly the foreign language. And, and again, as an American, there's not a lot of places left in the world like that where people don't have some English. So we, we can, often English speakers can be very lazy because almost everywhere we go, someone can communicate with you. And, um, you know, when I was in Yemen, you know, people spoke Russian, they spoke Arabic. They didn't speak a, a lot of English. So it really, you know, forced me to, to get my language skills. But, you know, again, I, I remember, you know, being in a village and this woman coming up to me and saying to me, you know, you're, uh, I don't believe you're a doctor, you know. And, well, of course, first of all, you know, all night long I'd have people coming with, you know, x-rays and telling me their medical problems. And I tried to explain to them that, you know, there were other kinds of doctors. But, again, they, they you know, hadn't had that exposure. And then, you know, they, this woman said to me, you know, you can't be a doctor because you don't speak very well. And quickly I realized, she didn't even realize there was another language because she'd never heard another language. She was in the village, very isolated. So, you know, fast forward 20 years later and, and actually I go back to that same village and it's actually gotten poor. And, you know, many of the colleagues, people that I met early on in my career, they were young scholars, many of them trained in Moscow, but they come back to Yemen and they come to work in the university. And, you know, today, if I go visit them, I feel very embarrassed because my career has gone up, my income has gone up, and they've gotten poor. You know, they, they have got extremely poor. So, you know, it's been fascinating for me. Not, you know, not, I just don't pick up the book and read it, but I feel very perplexed by it because as an economist and somebody who's worked on one of these countries in the bottom billion, to see the country stagnate like this while other countries have lifted themselves up and to see them actually get poorer, and it, as I said, you know, to see, see my uh, colleagues, my friends, people who have taken care of me actually, you know, not, not have more you know, uh, you know, go months without getting paid a salary from the university, you know, um, you know, have, have their, their children, horrible things happen to their children because they don't have opportunities. And, you know, again, so it's that, that perplexity. And, I, and I'm sure there's some people in this room who probably have 
you know, families or friends that are in, in countries like that, where they've actually seen these countries actually get poorer. And, you know, it's amazing because when I was there as a young scholar, I, I could only imagine that countries got better. I couldn't imagine at that time in my life because that, that was still the dominant paradigm. We had really sunk in to that mind frame. It was that idea that people were being lifted out of poverty. They weren't lift, being lifted back into poverty. So, you know, in the book when uh, Collier gives that, you know, uh, visual about, you know, someone sitting on a train and the train is rolling back, okay, um, that, that's how it is for a lot of these people in this bottom billion. They, they're, they're sitting there, they see the rest of the world, they see other places taking off, they hear stories about India and China, and yet they're watching themselves roll back down the hill. Okay? Um, and the other visual that he's got in there that, you know, again, you know, uh, we, we, we don't want to get too sentimental. We've got to figure out what the problem is. Okay? And, and, um, and in some ways, you know, economists are, are, are sometimes criticized because they, they get very technical. And, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about growth, and, and Collier spends a lot of time talking about growth. But on the other hand, we're, what we're trying to do is, is not be, you know, the headless heart, as it were. You know, it, it's not just about going out and giving charity, okay? It's about coming up with real solutions and ways that we can all benefit um, and, and there's some good reasons why we all need to progress and as I said even from a business standpoint if we think about companies and, and, and the, the expansion and growth that companies need to take they need to have markets um, these pe people in this bottom billion as it were offers a huge potential um, a lot of them are sitting in actually the irony and that, that's what, one of the things that we'll talk about very resource rich countries places that have um, lots of uh, natural resources um, as well as human resources that that and and as a, a kind of global economy we need to be able to harness those resources and those resources are going to become more precious as resources in other countries get used up and are, are no longer available those countries and those places it will be much more important the other thing that we see in the world today is we see that, again, if I, I look back to the 1980s, the dominant paradigm in the 1980s was that we needed to worry about strong states. Strong states that didn't share our values. Okay, so, you know, of course, the whole nuclear discussion and nuclear war was all around the fact that you had strong states that were uh, equipping themselves with uh, military equipment and, and that those were a threat. Okay, and so we met that threat by what? Conventional warfare, building up our armies, um, and then of course with soft skills, diplomatic skills. You know, the, the idea that we had to have things like the UN, countries had to come together, they needed to be able to talk. So all of that was extremely important then to that, that kind of particular that Cold War period and that notion and that paradigm then that the world needed to worry about and the world could be unstable by strong states. Today, we see that paradigm has shifted completely. Okay? Strong states are less of a concern. It's weak states, or what the UN calls fragile states. You know? And fragility is the biggest concern. And most of those fragile states, again, are in that bottom billion. Okay? And those states, because what do we see today? We see rogue elements. You know, Afghanistan, of course, was um, has been held up at, as a case in point with um, you know Al Qaeda and and the kind of training camps that existed there, and and the idea that they then become a, a formative force. And and again, when I talk about Yemen, Al Qaeda is uh, has a, a strong hold in in parts of Yemen, and uh, and so there's a lot of interest. And, and in fact, as, as sad as it is, there probably would be no interest in Yemen if Al Qaeda wasn't there. But it gives it that kind of strategic interest in terms of, of world security. So s some of the you know kind of self-interest driven uh, interest in this bottom billion, particularly on a political scale, then 
is that these fragile states, as we've seen, can be very de destabilizing for very strong states, uh, states that are, are developed. And, and like I said, it can be through terrorism, it can be through you know, uh, spillover effects to neighbors, um, and we've seen that in Africa where one country you know, ha has a, a civil war, it has some sort of uh, destabilization, and then it creates a huge refugee pro problem in other states. Um, and often, you know, an export of, of some of the same, you know, problems. Uh, and, and, you know, weak states, if a weak state is bordering a weak state, and then there's a civil war in one, and it spills over to the other, it can actually end up making the other state even poorer and more destabilized. So, so there's this kind of domino effect. Um, which is very different than the domino effect that we used to talk about again in the 70s and in the 80s. We used to talk about communism and the spread of communism and, and that kind of domino effect. But now we see in fragile states a very different um, kind of impact. Um, so again, it's, it's very important for us to, to look at this and then to also tie it into to our discussion as we move forward talking about technology and growth. So if we look at the stats for the bottom uh, million or billion, we see that 73% have recently been through civil wars. And in fact, uh, you know, the, the finding there on the statistics is that these bottom billion um, tend to have, on average, a civil war every five years. Okay? So, um, you know, they're, they're constantly in flux. There's constant internal uh, uh, volatility. 29% are caught in this resource trap, okay, and we will talk about a little more about what that resource trap is. And again, it's that idea that particularly certain kinds of resources create rents, and we're going to talk about what the rentier state is um, and, and what, what that means. And, and what are these kind of economic rents, and why do they create less stability rather than more stability? Uh, then there's the whole idea of 30% of these countries are landlocked, okay? And also uh, that 30%. So you've got some countries that have a lot of natural resources, okay? And the way those natural resources are being used or harnessed um, is, is very destabilizing. And, and creating uh, this kind of poverty trap. And then you also have some that are resource scarce, um, and particularly those that are landlocked. And, and, and again, if we think about some of these states, um, because they don't have access to waterways, and they, they cannot transport, and a lot of times they're countries that are surrounded by other very weak states. And so, uh, again, it's that spillover effect. Um, you know, I you know, taught in Lebanon for uh, a number of occasions, and uh, I go to Lebanon a lot. Lebanon's uh, a, an example. It, it's not landlocked, per se, but it's got neighbors around it that are constantly destabilizing it, okay? So uh, Lebanon is a very fragile state, and uh, constantly, the Lebanese have to constantly worry about what's happening in larger states that border it. So, it's not always just the landlocked ones, but, but it is a phenomenon with, the, with particular states. And then 76% are in countries with bad governance and poor policies. And that's something I really want to, to emphasize because the, the lack of rule of law, some, and again, uh, for, for uh, individuals that have grown up in countries that have uh, not just legal systems, not just laws on the books, because if I go to Yemen, They've got all the laws on the books, okay? The World Bank and the IMF and all the in other international organizations and countries have come in and made, help them get all the laws on the book. But it's respect for those laws on the books. It's uh, a judicial system that works correctly is what's imperative to good governance. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, if I, I, I've talked to business people in Yemen and, and, you know, they say, well, you know, you, they're, you know, why don't you, you know, invest more money? Because a lot of them, any money they earn, they put abroad, and it's because they don't, they don't trust the financial system, they don't trust the government 
Um, you know, you, things can be seized, your money can be seized in a bank, it can be frozen. So, so that lack of, of rule of law and, and the lack of good governance then is a, a big issue for a number of these countries. So, again, the, you know, the problem is that these countries have essentially fallen behind, but they've not only fallen behind, uh, they've fallen apart, okay? And uh, if we look back, uh, particularly we look at the 1970s, and as, as I said to you last time, you know, after World War II, you know, there was this epiphany in, in the West and in places like the United States. And, and again, you know, the, we have to be a little cynical. There, there's kind of two drivers at play here. You've got politics and economics. Um, and of course, uh, I'm an economist, so I'm going to take much more of, you know, an economic approach. Um, and I, I, I believe quite firmly that if you can solve people's economics problems, you can solve many of their political problems. But you can't dissect, you can't separate markets and institutions. And that's why this course is so important, is because you, you've got to understand, regardless where you go in the world to do business. Um, and you know, I think sometimes the fallacy of a lot of business people is that they um, sometimes forget how important institutions are. And as important as it is, is having relationships and you know doing business, uh, you know, on, on an individual basis, those institutions, those institutional <coughs> structures matter. And, and again, we can look at the case of the United States in many places where you know uh, U.S. businesses have got themselves in trouble where they looked to be bailed out and, and many times it was because they had ignored a lot of those crucial signs. They had ignored the fact that, that the, um, the political system that was in place where they, they were uh, attempting to do business was not really conducive to market forces. Okay? So, so, so as much as it's nice, you know, and, and as I said, part of the reason I'm a political economist rather than just an economist is because I, I, I think that we have to recognize that, that intertwining um, manner in which you know institutions and markets function. So even as a business person, you you know you would be very naive to go into a place just based on economic numbers. On the other hand, there's a correlation, and that's what Collier finds. Um, and in this article, I'm going to post up as well uh, on uh, you know greed and grievances that countries that have high incomes. And in fact, the higher you can bring up a country's income, by the way, even income inequality d diminishes. Okay, So you get much less uh, income distribution problems, as it were, by being able to bring up. So when you bring up income, you bring up eventually, you bring up everybody's income. And the higher you can bring up that income, everybody's pulled up. Okay, so. As, as important it is to look at what kind of growth the country has, any kind of growth is better than no growth. And that's why when I said to you last time after World War II, when there was a real focus on, wow, let's infuse capital. And if we push capital into these uh, economies, we can get something like we saw in Germany and Japan, where you know we, we gave them a lot of money and they used it and, and pull themselves up. Now, of course, in hindsight, we can look back and we can say, well, gosh, Germany and Japan had an institutional structure, okay? That they had what we call absorption capacity. And, and you know, that's a very important word when thinking about <coughs> development because the ability to absorb funds, you know, if, if I came to you right now and I said, okay, I'm going to give each of you a million pounds, and but I'm going to give you one week to spend that million pounds, and it's got to be on something that's going to make, you know, uh, UEL better. Okay. All right. So now some of you will come up with some good ideas, but there's going to be limits to how much can be absorbed in that short period of time. So I have a feeling some of it would just be spent. Spent on things that would, you know, in the short run, might make us all happy. You know, a great party, you know, you could buy us a boat. I mean, you know, 
all sorts of things. But <coughs> the point is that how much of it would be sustainable? And that's the question. Now, in the short run, as we know from, uh, from economics, you'll get a multiplier effect. So that all that money coming in here will, in the short run, boost up the activity here, okay? We would have lots of things going on, you know, and it would be an incredible week, and there would be the hangover effect because, you know, the stuff that would be generated would be used for a while. But soon, if you, if you bought a lot of equipment, the equipment would get broke, and there wouldn't be enough people here to service all the equipment. Okay, and to implement all the, the programs. And that's exactly what happens in a lot of these developing countries. Because they don't have the absorption capacity, they don't have the institutional structure, that even when they're given large amounts of aid, a lot of that aid ends up, e even in genuine circumstances where people are genuine about the fact that they want to use it to do good things. They're not necessarily, you know, not everybody out there is corrupt. Just, you know, and I definitely don't want to give that impression, you know. I would say the vast majority of people, e even a lot of the people in, in these governments, I, I would say they all came to power with some sort of agenda, and that was a meritable agenda. Now, how over the years that played itself out is a different matter. But I don't think people actually purposely come to power to be greedy, okay, or, or to do in... Their, their, their population. <coughs> but again, one of the biggest issues that's confronted is this issue of absorption capacity, the ability. So, so even if the World Bank comes along and they say, okay, we're, you need so much, and we're going to just give you $200 billion you know, uh, dollars today to spend, these countries can't spend it. And, and that's been an important lesson that the world's had to learn uh, in terms of fostering <coughs> development, is that the absorption capacity of a country, their ability then to use effectively aid and money that's channeled into those countries is as important as the bottom line figure. And you know, studies have shown, some studies show that when that aid gets over 15% of your GDP, in most of these developing countries, their ability then to channel the money effectively <coughs> drops exponentially. And the more money that's channeled in, again, and then that explains, too, why you end up with a lot of corruption, okay? Because if you hand me a million dollars and you tell me to use it for a week and I can't figure out enough projects and I'm sitting there with 600,000, you know how tempting that is? So you can just imagine what happens in a lot of these countries. So, um, and I'm not trying to be an apologist for corruption because I'm not, okay? It, it, it's a horrible thing. And, um, but uh, some of it is a byproduct of a lack of appreciation of countries' abilities. And this is why, you know, even in terms of linking up with universities in, in many of these countries and fostering kind of development to help businesses and individuals get education levels up so that it can be better absorbed, because it's crucial. So, you know, the reality then is that we see a lot of these countries. So, so in spite of all the goodwill that happened in the 1960s, and, and as I said, the 1960s and 1970s, lots of money was being poured in. We were pour, pouring it in the United States, Europe, the former Soviet Union was pouring lots of money into these countries. So, in the 60s and 70s, it actually looked like the whole thing was working, okay? Many people said, wow, you know, this aid thing, you know, this capital infusion, it worked. But then what happened, as soon as you pull back on pouring the money in, because of course when you're pouring the money in, what were you getting? You're getting that multiplier effect. And even if half of that money was getting siphoned off to a Swiss bank account or some you know, huge mansion that, that wasn't going to have any sorts of um, long-term effect in that country, it still, in the short run, put people to work, they had to build the mansion, you know, um, you know, so, you know, the, the roads, all sorts of things were being made. But a lot of these things were not sustainable. So when then countries would then stop giving as much, and, and, and there, there was, a, you know, of course the 1970s, we see what, in places like the United States and uh, the West and, and in Europe, we saw what? We saw the oil crisis, okay? We saw stagflation, you know, where you had 
uh, high inflation with very uh, high unemployment. That word was invented in the 1970s. All right, and um, you know, and and so there was a pullback in the 1970s from from this money. And and as we get into the 80s, then and and things even tighten up more. Of course, 1982 we had the Latin America debt crisis because these countries in Latin America just said, whoa, we can't pay anymore. Uh, and so, you know, all of that then, we started to see what? We started to see that these countries that had been growing and looked like they were on board with everybody else and moving in the same direction, all of a sudden we start to get the divergence. Okay, we start to see them actually move back. So that we see then, that in the 1970s, you had per capita income was rising at 0.5% uh, a year in the, these bottom billion. But then in the 1980s, it starts declining, okay? Because there's less aid, there's less money being pushed in, and um, they're not able to continue to develop because it, the money wasn't being used in a way that was sustainable. It was not creating a long-term lasting change, as it were. So that you start then now to see. So, so again, we can look back and we can talk about the 19th century and we can talk about the great divergence, which was the breakaway of Western countries, as, as we know them, from uh, what later was termed the third world or developing countries. And that very much uh, had to do with the Industrial Revolution. And then we can now <coughs> identify a second divergence, okay? And, and that would be then in these, this period of the 1980s where you get this bottom billion starts to diverge from this kind of upper four, five billion, as it were, um, uh, uh, rest of the world. And, and that's, that's very significant. Um, of course now, we could even argue that we've got the, everybody else, the rest, the rest of us are converging, you know, um, and, and we'll talk about this theme later on more. But you know, India and China, uh, and you know, with the the kind of global financial crisis and the slowdown in places like Europe and the United States, you, we're seeing much more of convergence. But again, while all of these countries seem to be converging in a very interesting way with a kind of a new economic shifts, we've still got this group down here that's continuing to to diverge, not converge, and that's very worrisome. So that, you know, we see then the 1990s, and, and, it, and you know, the 1990s will be remembered as being really uh, very significant uh, in many ways. Um, and that's because the, the growth rates were so accelerated. So that, you know, again, by 1990s, then you see the absolute decline in these countries by 0.5%. <coughs> And now, as we reach, you know, the 21st century, we see that these countries have literally are back to where they were in the 1970s, okay? So, they, they have literally just been stagnant. And so, uh, and, and not, uh, and actually are poorer than they were when they started out. And that's why, you know, people often talk about Africa and the fact that Africa today is actually poorer than it was uh, when economists, started looking to develop Africa, you know, and, and in, in the 1960s when all of these economic paradigms were being put forward and, and Africa was the laboratory as it was, um, you know, for really testing out some of these ideas about uh, growth, about uh, agriculture, about technology use, all of these things, all, all of these programs, all the billions and billions of dollars that have been plowed into Africa, Africa today is poorer than when it started out. When it started that journey, it was actually in some ways better off. So again, it, it's, it's important that we, we, we take the time then to reflect because we have literally, in terms of human capital, in terms of finances, the amount of money that has been plowed in to uh, creating quote unquote development has been a dismal failure, okay? Um, for, the, for particularly this group. On the other hand, like I said, we see other places that, that have seemed to take off. So does growth, ma growth matter? Well, yes, it does. And, you know, next time we're gonna talk even more about it. Uh, 
as I said, as an, an economist, I believe very firmly in the fact that, you know, call it what you may, uh, economic growth <coughs> matters. Now, it does need to be sustainable. You know, we need to have growth that is real growth. And, and by real growth, we're talking about long-run aggregate supply, okay? Not just short-run aggregate supply. We're talking about really creating sorts of things. So if we think about a country and its uh, product possibility frontier, we're talking about things that actually shift that curve, okay? So that uh, we're not just talking about movements along the curve, but really shifting the ability of these countries. So either by generating uh, more growth through technological change, which, you know, of course, this will be very important to what we're going to talk about. And many economists today, you know, and the solo model was all about the fact that, you know, it's technological shocks and, and shocks that really create economic long-run aggregate supply change and growth. And um, so that, that is going to be very important. But it's the idea that when you have incomes, and, and we all know this from our personal incomes, when your income goes up, you spend more on everything, okay? Um, your entire lifestyle changes. Uh, and I can assure you of that, all right? <laughs> and, and even if you don't think that you're changing or your spending habits are, they are. So, and it's the same thing. If we look at these countries, we see that countries, if we look at India today, we look at China today, we look at you know, Brazil, we look at Malaysia, we look at Singapore, we don't just have to fo focus on the BRIC countries, we look at Turkey, <coughs> we see that countries whose incomes are going up, okay, and, and going up at a consistent rate, they are, fewer people are in poverty, they have more political stability, okay, they tend to have higher education attainment, um, so all of those things that we associate with good growth. So, now, the reason I emphasize that is because growth has gotten a very bad name um, by some in the development community because they have felt like um, economists have focused on growth when in fact it's not about growth. It's about, um, you know, what happens, what kind of growth. Now, I'm not saying it's not important how a country grows. But, you know, we know one thing, and, and, and it's really brought out in this book by Collier, and that is if, you know, we, this bottom billion is not growing at all, okay? They're going the opposite way. So at this point, I think we'll all take just some growth in a positive way. Um, but, you know, what, one of the, the, the issues that is often brought up is this um, question about the Millennium Development Goals, okay, which are very important. And it's, these are goals for 2015, and if we look down this uh, list, uh, we, unfortunately, I, I think the majority of this bottom billion is um, going to miss it, okay? They're, they're not going to be where they are. But this idea, and this idea behind uh, the, you know, the Millennium Goals and Millennium Development was to get all these countries, so you got 193 UN member nations that have signed up to agree to try by 2015 to achieve these goals. So, of course, eradicating extreme poverty, uh, you know, universal primary education, and do you know why primary education? Because, you know, one of the things uh, that studies show, of course, in lots of developing countries, they, they want to create universities. and. Uh, but in fact, uh, university education is not the best buy, and particularly for a lot of developing countries. The best buy is, of course, literacy, people who can read and write and basic literacy, and that's why there's a lot of emphasis on primary education. The other thing is that uh, universities are very expensive to run. They take a lot of resources, yet they tend not to educate as many people and in many ways, um, if you don't have the expertise and specialism, they can often create uh, lots of expectations and not good education. Uh, whereas primary education consistently across the board shows very high results. Furthermore, educating women is the best buy a country can make. Because women who are 
more educated tend to do a better job raising their children because they're more aware about things like health and, and, and they will transmit those, those skills, that commitment to education to their children. So primary education then is, is very important. And sometimes, you know, it can be uh, very difficult going into some countries where they have very poor education systems because, again, they want to have universities and they, there's a certain amount of prestige associated with having universities, but universities are very expensive and, and they divert a lot of resources. So that's why one of the Millennium Goals in is this universal primary education, and by universal for, for uh, women and men. So again, gender equality and empowerment of women, reducing child mortality rates, which is extremely important, uh, maternal health, you know, AIDS, of course, HIV, malaria, and really creating this kind of sustainable environment. So uh, very important. So these are all very important goals, but none of them really, you know, again, in and of themselves, <coughs> we still need economic growth, all right? All of those goals are achievable in a country that's growing. And, um, and so it's, it's really, it's, it's the idea that we don't, of course we need to, you know, create what kind of growth, and we want sustainable growth. As I said, we don't want to just infuse cash and have short-term growth. But, you know, if we look at uh, countries, you know, and, and one of the big dilemmas between countries, uh, you know, the, the kind of Western paradigm, the neoclassical uh, idea of, of how do you get development, and then, you know, more uh, socialist development, was, again, it's the idea that you can have a more equitable society but you can also not necessarily have people who are living at a higher standard. So the idea is to create real income growth. So in these countries though, the, 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 the point is that the, the argument is much more basic. It's not just about how to grow. It's about, you know, really what growth can take place because these countries are not growing at all. They're actually uh, going the other way. They've got negative growth. So how do you get positive growth in these countries? And then once we get that positive growth, then we can think more about how we can allocate that growth. Um, because we have spent, again, lots of money, lots of time on the how and, and not the why. And so we, we want to really try to get that. And that, that's what I think Collier is trying to capture in, in this uh, book. Because if we look at the numbers, and again, the fallacy being that growth is biased uh, against poor homes. Um, now, where did that come from? And this is why I'm going to put this article for you. You know, Simon Kuznets came up with this theory, and it was very much embraced by the World Bank and the IMF. And it was this idea that um, there would be a trickle-down effect. Okay? So, Kuznets his theory is that you know you want to create you don't focus on the poor and then in the short run uh, actually when you start to develop a country you might actually end up with less equitable distribution of income all right it's the idea that you want to really focus and again it came, you know he wrote this and it came out at the time when there was a lot of emphasis on capital a lot of emphasis on infrastructure so his idea was you wanted to focus on urban areas. And, 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 and again, one of the high criticisms uh, of Kuznets' work is that it created urban biases and uh, what we often call uh, first city uh, dilemmas. So if you put all the money, so if you think about a lot of countries in Africa or you even think about other places, you get this, this notion where you get this bias towards um, certain countries um, or certain cities as it were so for example if I think about Egypt Cairo is is the real center and uh, if I think about uh, Kenya I think about Nairobi okay um, and, and and you know you can think about uh, you know other cities like this it's it's the idea but now if I say to you in the United States of course you might think about New York but LA is important, Boston's a great city, Chicago's a great city, okay? So 
it's this idea that you have these large countries where you get one city, and, and you know, Cairo is a great example, Mexico City is a great example, where they are literally huge cities. Um, and the reason is because lots of the growth, because the military, so often the city where the military is located and the government is located, gets biased. And it was the idea that, you know, you wanted to help industry, for example, um, and we had what we called, you know, state capitalism, where money would be channeled into the government, a lot of the aid money would be channeled into the government, and the government would essentially create industry. Is there an echo in here? Does that help? Um, so you get that, you know, uh, first city effect, and it's, it's a lot because what happened and what Cousins was saying was you want to give the money to the government, you want them to really create the factories, uh, because why? Because businesses are too underdeveloped in these countries, and you don't have the entrepreneur class, and you don't have the uh, <coughs> class of people that can really take businesses forward. So what you do then is you actually create then uh, through the government, the kind of infrastructure and the emphasis and, and in terms of thinking about industry and thinking about how the, the economy should grow. Then after you get that, then they will distribute it and people will come. They'll come from the urban areas, the rural areas, into the urban areas and there'll be cheap labor and they'll, they'll get this surplus. And so the whole emphasis was on industrial development. And the idea was that a lot of these developing countries they had resources, but they weren't harnessing the resources. They were sending the resources out as raw materials to have them manufactured and developed elsewhere. So the idea was you would bring it all inside to these areas and, and develop it inside the country. Uh, let me just see if I can get that. So the idea then was, okay, <laughs> I put the mute on there, uh, but you had to get these countries and these economies in such a way that you could then, once you got that growth going in these first cities, it would trickle down to the rest of the economy. So you didn't need to focus on the poor, and in fact, one of the biggest criticisms of the World Bank and the World uh, and the International Monetary Fund was the lack of focus on poor. So now, if you go to the World Bank site, what do you think you're going to see? Lots of information about the poor and things like slogans: "We're here to er eradicate poverty." Okay, because one of the biggest criticisms of them in the uh, 80s and even in the into the 90s was that they they focus too much on, you know, the building, you know, from the top, and that this trickle-down effect never was happening. So they come in and they, particularly the IMF, because the IMF was worried about the balance of payments, and they would try to get a situation where, you know, they get the monetary system. So much of what they would do would be to address, you know, things like inflation, and um, but to do that, they would often put in austerity measures. Okay, so they might say to the government. You know, you've got to cut your your budget by 50%. Now, we know here in the UK, right? When 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 budget cutting stops starts to happen, who often gets and feels the impact the most? <coughs> the poor. Okay. So, um, in many of these countries where their ver their subsidies are much less, um, you know, many of the programs that were put in place were seen as very unequitable because the people down below were having to absorb much more of the burden of correcting the problems that were seen as structural issues in the economy than the people on the top. But wait, then the theory would say, ah, but this is a short-term phenomena and in the long run, everybody's gonna be better off because even though it's gonna be painful in the short run, in the long run, once the economy gets going and things are sorted, it'll trickle down. Well, 
the trickle down never happened. And then, you know, one of the jokes among development economists is, uh, Kuznet never defined exactly what the long run was. So most countries never get to the long run. Okay, they're always in this kind of short run horizon. So, uh, you know, this is then why uh, much of the criticism has been about growth and, and the fact that it's not good for the poor. And a lot of it has to do with the World Bank and the IMF and, and because when countries need loans, they often have to go in to the World Bank and the IMF and, and get loans because they can't get anyone else to loan the money. And when they go to the World Bank and the IMF, the IMF and the World Bank it put in a system of what they call conditionalities, which are often called structural changes, where they say, okay, we're not going to give you this loan. And remember, the World Bank and IMF only give loans. They never give aid. It's all loans. And they say, we're not going to give you the loan unless you do X, Y, and Z. And X, Y, and Z are often not very pro-poor. Now, so that's why there grew this view that growth, because the, the World Bank and IMF would say, you know, we know this is a bad pill and it tastes bad, but it's really good for your health in the long run, okay? So swallow the pill, you know, and yes, it's gonna be, be hard on the poor, but you know, uh, you know they'll, they'll, they'll work, work it out, you'll work through it, and, and this is the only way you can get your economy growing, okay, and on a growth path. So you can imagine, it didn't do much for the word growth in the literature. And um, people got a very uh, biased opinion that much of structural adjustment and the things that the IMF and the World Bank were putting in place then were anti-poor, okay? But in fact, actually, as you can see from this graph, growth is very pro-poor. And, and, and this article that I'll put up for you by uh, Dollars and Craig is, was actually written at the World Bank when Paul Collier was there, when he was the director. And it was a very controversial article. But it talks just about why growth is pro-poor. Okay, and it talks about the fact is that in many of these countries, and, and again, I saw this in the case of Yemen, many of the policy changes were not necessarily bad for, for the poor, but it was how they were implemented, or the other things that came along, or the inequitable way, or the fact that they weren't implemented correctly. Okay? And the other thing is you get what we call often in the literature a principal agent problem. So in some of these countries, it's easier to blame the World Bank and the IMF, okay, uh, than it is to take responsibility for what's going on in the economy. So often when people would get disgruntled then, they would say, well, you know, it's not our, our fault. We needed the loan and they made us, you know, put in place these policy changes. Um, but in reality, like I said, growth and having incomes and having incomes go up regardless how they go up, and we did see it in these countries in the, in the 60s, it creates incomes that go up, help everyone, okay? And eventually they create more money. And the higher you can get the income up, the more people you will push from the lower class and you'll create less income inequality over time. So, so this is important. So as you can see, the countries that have the highest per capita income tend to also have a higher uh, uh, standard of living, kind of life satisfaction, okay? In countries on the whole that have lower incomes, with, with a few exceptions, um, tend, tend to um, have a lower life satisfaction. Now, the other thing is, and it's important, you know, it's interesting now, um, I'm sure all of you remember all the hype about the Arab Spring, Okay, and, and you know, again, initially when, when the Arab Spring started taking place, there was this idea, of, we just need to get these bad guys out of office and everything's gonna be great, okay? And, uh, you know, of course, things don't change that easy. And unfortunately, often regime, regime change just changes the faces, okay? Because you still got the same structures in place. And, and this is why, um, Collier and, and, and a number of people are a bit cynical about regime change. And that's why when you read this article about grievances, you always have to be a little skeptical of, of, of change. Now that's not to say that the people in office are bad guys or they're not running the place right. 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that every rebel group that steps up to the plate and starts to say they want to overthrow a place, um, have some sort of revolutionary change, will be the good guys, okay? And, um, you know, I think now it's interesting to see the Arab Spring as it's playing out a few years down the road and start to see that, yes, you know, growth is less in Egypt and places like that. Now, it does not mean that eventually, if they get the institutional structure, but change, civil wars are messy, okay? And they don't necessarily, and what we see in these bottom billion countries and these fragile states is that unfortunately they are in a cycle of violence. So they are, they are constantly having regime change, okay? So what made the Middle East much more <coughs> interesting, as it were, was that in the Middle East, many of these countries had had a lot more stability than places in Africa where you see a much quicker cycle of change. Um, they, they, you know, we were talking about people who had really consolidated their power. Now they were authoritarian regimes, and in many cases very brutal regimes, but they were able then to use force to stay in power. But it didn't mean necessarily that because there is now regime change, that this scenario has changed. And, and particularly when we look at the case of Yemen, Yemenis who, who uh, thought they were taking part in the Arab Spring have, have, are very disillusioned. And so the same problems, and you know, Yemen is still on the verge of a civil war. It might even have a, a civil war uh, very soon. Uh, because, again, the regime change just changed the face. What's gone on hasn't really changed. And this, this is, this is what's very important to realize. So many of these countries, it's not, it's not so much about who's at the head. And if you think about uh, healthy democracies, uh, you know, often we look to the ballot box to, to measure democracy. We say, ah, you know, look, and, and, and you know, I have to tell you, as an American, we're the worst to do that. You know, when the Iraqis first went to the poll or in Afghanistan, you know, we, we put it all over the TV. And the irony is Americans themselves don't get out and vote, okay? We have a very low voter participation rate. Why is that? Well, it's because we're a, a country that's based off institutions. And so, yeah, it matters a bit who's up there at top, but it doesn't matter significantly. And, you know, it's the same thing in this country, you know, yeah, it, a little bit of change here, a little bit of change there, but, but the overall kind of structure of society, the laws that are embedded within the judicial system, do not change in any kind of revolutionary way, as it were, just because you change the person at top. Okay, so why is that? Well, it's because not only do we have a rule of law, and we have a judicial system, and, and, and we have a security system, but we also have civil society, okay? And civil society is the whole notion, you know, of, of people who mobilize themselves. You know, if you belong to a club, um, an organization, people who, who are, um, you know, engaged in their communities, those people, those grassroots individuals who are, you know, your town councils, your, uh, your school boards, uh, these all are what really create an engaged society. Those are actually a much better measurement than how many people get out to the ballot box, you know. Um, it's interesting because I, I, I have Lebanese citizenship. So in, nine, in 2009, Lebanon had, had an election. Now, Lebanon is a country that's very much a confessional system. And so people vote along sectarian lines. And <coughs> the reason they do that is because it would seem illogical to vote another way. Because even if that other candidate sounds more interesting, it would be like being a self-hater. You know, you, you, you wouldn't vote against your community. Because why, even if you don't like that guy that represents your community, you know there's something inside that tells you that that person is there to represent you. And that, you know, for better or worse, they have your interests at stake. It would be a, a very illogical, scary thing, you know, to go and vote for someone else who's in another confessionary group. Because when that person gets elected, you know what's going to happen, right? 
they're going to pander to their, their group. So you want <coughs> your person in who's going to pander to you. So it really, before the election even started in 2009, most, most of all the, the votes, they were already tied up. Okay, It wasn't like some profound sort of thing where, but people still went out and voted, you know, because it, and <coughs> they, they had to show their alliance to their confession. You know, but it was, it was not necessarily because they were expecting some radical upset, you know, um, and, um, you know, people pretty much knew which areas were going to vote what. You know, I remember there was a politician in, in uh, Lebanon at the time who got up and she, she was going to step down from her seat. Okay, this is an elected seat, not, not a, uh, you know, we're not talking about a monarchy, all right? And she gets up, she, she's in the parliament. And she says, I'm stepping down, and I'm giving the seat to my son. <laughs> All right? Now, that just illustrates with how, you know, that was seen within, you know. Um, and of course, you know, the son had to go through the motions, you know, and, and be elected. But, you know, uh, of course the son was elected, you know. So, and it's the same thing, you know, uh, in Syria. Uh, you know, when uh, Bashir Assad was, you know, first elected, I mean, w w one of the things would be, well, you know, you, political analysts would not look in the Middle East, they would not look to places like Syria or Liberty, Libya to say, um, oh, well, the people really got out and they voted for Gaddafi today, okay? They, they would look to see how much of a margin, you know, same thing with Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, they would look to see how much of a margin would that dictator, as it were, allow themselves to lose? Now, they would say, well, if he allows himself to lose by a bigger margin, that's a sign that he's feeling very confident, okay? And if he's feeling less confident or unsure uh, uh, of his, uh, his political stability, he'll keep the margin lower, okay? So, it wasn't at all about, well, gosh, there could be an upset, you know, or somebody else could get elected. Um, but it was about that kind, kind of margin, all right, in, in terms of th thinking about some of these places. So again, you know, it's the whole idea that uh, civil wars and don't necessarily always bring about, uh, you know, this notion that somehow a civil war, you know, uh, is going to bring about a better regime, regime change, and that that regime change is going to be positive. In many of these countries in the bottom billion, they are constantly in a cycle of violence and they're constantly having regime changes. I mean, it's interesting in Yemen, you know, uh, Ali Abdallah Saleh came to power in 1978. And when he came to power, uh, before he got there, you know, there was, of course, the guy who, you know, got the briefcase that blew up. It was the other guy, you know, who got gunned down, you know, getting out of his car. And, you know, the, the, uh, the U.S. CIA, you know, they expected Saleh to last maybe a week, you know, um, of course, he really did, you know, uh, you know, last a long time. I mean, when you think that he lasted from 1978 to, you know, 2011. In fact, again, there was a little joke, you know, they call him the Teflon man, you know, because he always stuck. And, you know, he, he was able to, you know, see a lot longer period in, in, in uh, political office. And, and that was very unusual. But he did that by using, um, you know, a, a very clientele, this way, you know, working the tribes. He was very, very crafty in, in terms of, of his his political uh, maneuvering. It wasn't because he was, a, you know, a great leader, and that he was, you know, empowering the country or, or making it a better place. So again, it, it's it's that link between risk and war. But what we do find, and again, to just kind of hammer in the point a little more, is that countries that have more higher income levels, okay, um, they tend to be less at risk of civil wars, which makes sense, okay? Places that are, 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 are riskier, that have more wars, are the ones that either have slow growth or declining growth. So, and those countries that have slow or declining growth, as I said, on <coughs> average, so that means if on average they have a civil war every five years, and some of them are not having a civil war every five years, that means some of them are having a civil war or some sort of civil, and when I say civil war, you know, how civil war is defined in that context is, um, you know, the University of Michigan came up with uh, some data, and, and of course, 
you know, there's constant conflict in, in places. So how, how do you actually define that kind of disturbance? And it was when you got over kind of a thousand deaths, you know, within, uh, you know, a year and in, in some sort of civil conflict. So again, we're not talking about just a skirmish on the streets being defined as a civil war, but actually a major conflict. And so uh, these countries are particularly at risk Then we have the whole question of natural resources, which is a very important question. And in fact, again, because I work on the Middle East and I've, I've written on this topic, and that is what we often call the resource curse. You know, um, when we look at the GCC, the Gulf Corporation Council states, we often ask the question, you know, um, and what the Gulf Corporation Council is Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, Qatar, uh, Oman, the United Arab Emirates, um, Kuwait, and uh, seems like I'm missing one. Um, but these countries make up the GCC, and uh, you know, often the discussion is around whether or not oil is a blessing or is it a curse for these countries. Okay, and uh, because resources can be uh, very controversial, but particularly in the bottom billion we see that uh, resources can often be used very negatively. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and in Africa, of course, the question of diamonds, and blood diamonds in particular, di the, you know, diamonds and the revenues from diamonds have been used to, to fuel uh, conflict um, in, in many places in Africa. But more so than that are the questions, two questions. One, one is, gets back to, you know, this question of what is a rentier state, you know? And essentially, it's a state that lives off rents, okay? And what do we mean by rents? Well, we're talking about economic rents. We're talking about surpluses. And we're talking about rents that are generated not necessarily by, you know, productivity. We're talking about, for example, if we look at oil, okay? Oil's considered, the revenues from oil is considered a rent. So that very few people in, for example, Saudi Arabia actually work in the oil industry. But those, the money from that generates revenues. And those revenues come back as kind of surplus income that then is used to essentially, you know, at the state level. So one of the reasons that rents can be very troublesome and problematic is that they don't come to individual people, per se. Okay, they come to the state, and then the state distributes them. And in mint, oil revenues are particularly problematic, and that's why there's been a lot <coughs> written about them. And, and in fact, I, I would make an argument that if we look at some of the GCC states, statehood has never really been tried yet, okay? Because what has happened is that, uh, particularly in the smaller Gulf states, so uh, you know, Bahrain is, is a little different. You know, a lot of people don't realize that in Bahrain they don't have as much oil, and they have a, a very bifurcated kind of population. And historically, they've had much more, you know, a conflict than than other states in the GCC. I mean, it was highlighted during the Arab Spring, but you know, Bahrain has always historically had much more of a contentious environment. But if we go to places like the United Arab Emirates, where um, and, you know we look at places like Dubai, where 80% of the population are uh, foreign population, only 20% is is indigenous. Um, Qatar has a very small indigenous population. Then what we see is in often in these countries is that the government gets these this money, they get this surplus rent, and and there's almost a informal contract with the citizens. So for example, in the UAE, actually. Uh, there is no, no, citizens don't vote in the UAE, okay? They, they've got the seven emirates and, and you know, they, they've got their heads and they've got their council, but there's not actually universal suffrage. People are not going to the voting polls, okay? Now, but, you know, how, how does that work? Well, because the, the government gets those rents and then they distribute them, and they're very generous with the, how they distribute those rents, and so, consequently, that has led to, a, and in some ways, the argument has been put forth, a, a pacification then of the populace. Um, it's more problematic in places like Saudi Arabia because you've got a much larger population. And as 
you know, changes in oil revenues have often led to uh, periods where there's been a, a little more discontent. What we see, however, is that um, these economies are not very diversified. And even when, what's in, really interesting about the GCC is when they've tried to diversify, they're not very successful at it. And that's what gets into this idea of the Dutch disease, okay? That when you have this kind of increased revenue that's based off natural resources, it tends to then create um, some artificial uh, situation in terms of it makes the currency, the exchange rate, higher, okay? Then, when you try to diversify your economy and you try to go into, say, producing other kinds of goods or services, it makes them less competitive. So the Dutch disease is the whole idea, and of course it had to do with the Netherlands and it had to do with oil, but it's the idea that um, if you start to get a natural resource and that natural resource starts to drive the economy and that the economy then starts to become dependent on those rents from that natural resource, it causes the exchange rate then to go up, okay? Because it makes your, your currency stronger relative to other currencies. Consequently then, when you try to diversify your economy into other sectors, you're not competitive. And, uh, and, and this has really been illustrated in the case of the GCC, where there has been, you know, um, billions over the last decade and a half spent on diversification. And yet, you know, I recently uh, worked with somebody on an article, and what did we find? We found that they're no lot more diversified than they were when they started the exercise of trying to diversify. And why? A lot of it is because they lack the competitiveness, is one of the reasons, and also because they, 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 the things that they tried to diversify in are not necessarily things where they have a comparative advantage in. But this, again, is a big problem for many of the, you know, countries in Africa that have a lot of natural resources. Nigeria is a case in point. Where, you know, Nigeria has a lot of its population that are not necessarily being used effectively, okay? And when they try to go into other sectors, they're not very competitive. Why? Because they've got a strong oil industry. They, they, they garnish significant rents. Those rents tend to go to the government and they're not necessarily distributed in a way that's very efficient in terms of building up the, the rest of society. So this is part of the natural resource problem then that it is uh, taking place in many of these countries. <coughs> so that you end up then particularly getting these rents that tend to be surrounded by a, a very small group of individuals, okay, who then are essentially in charge of distributing those rents uh, to the rest of society and then also creating kind of the mechanisms for growth and as, as we have seen in numerous occasions in numerous locations state capitalism tends to be inefficient you know when the state tries to create manufacturing or industry it tends not to be efficient enough to kind of produce the sort of competitiveness and also it, it's the idea that the state then starts to drive what's selected. So, you know, it's, it's the idea that, you know, if I allow the market mechanism to work, and if I allow, uh, the market mechanism will select the kinds of industries that can be more competitive, and that they, they will uh, flourish. But when the state intervenes, there's uh, always this problem of, you know, the spillover effects, which industries get fostered, which don't, why they get, and, and again, if you've not got a good governance and you've not got a good political system, you often run into this problem of, of picking out industries that are not necessarily going to be winners in terms of, of the society. And that's, that's what we've seen in a number of times in, in the case of the GCC. You know, we've seen actually uh, foreign consultants, for example, come in and pick out, you know, industries that are, you know, very labor intensive in countries where the indigenous population is not there to, to necessarily harness this. So, so th then what you're doing is you're creating a further dependency on expatriate labor um, and, and people coming in from outside. So it's, it's a very complex dilemma then that surrounds the, the whole notion of resources and, and their allocation of resources in terms of these economies. <coughs>
Is bad governance the root of the problem? Well, yes it is, okay? Um, again, if you don't have a, a rule of law, if you don't have the institutional structures and mechanism, um, and if we look again, if we look, at, there are some countries in Africa now that seem to be pulling themselves up. You know, a, a very interesting case study is Mozambique that seems to be getting their act together. And again, what do I mean by getting their act together? Well, it means that they're, they're getting the kind of institutional structure in place and um, the kind of rule of law that is conducive to economic growth. And this is extremely <coughs> important. Um, and, and you know, what we've seen over and over again is the, the notion, and, and, and you know, I will talk more about it in, in a minute when I talk about Yemen in particular, uh, the whole idea of, you know, if you just give aid to these countries, and, and are you not creating another kind of rent? So if we talk about natural resources, and we talk about the consolidation of natural resources in the hands of a few, who then don't necessarily use those uh, revenues from those resources for you know, a, a, a wide distribution of, of development needs and, and, you know, in terms of the economy, then if we say that that's problematic, and then we turn around and we use aid or we use loans that, again, are channeled through the government, and uh, then they're not used correctly, are we not exasperating the whole problem? And you know, what we see in the case of Africa, what we see in a lot of the non-oil states in the Middle East, that particularly what, what is troublesome is when that money is not just free-handed aid, it's not a grant, but when it's a loan. Because as I mentioned to you last time, you know, Africa is hugely indebted to banks and um, international organizations uh, where they have actually paid back the actual principle, the actual original debt, sometimes ten times over, and yet they <coughs> still are not even touching the principle. They're still just servicing the interest, and and this this vicious circle of of debt and debt relief that that has um, developed in, in the developing world. So, so again, you have to have you know good governance. You have to have good institutions. You have to have a, a rule of law. People have to be able to trust those institutions. And if you've got those good institutions, then you can, businesses will flourish. You know, business flourishes where there's stability. If I am a business person, I don't want to go into a country where I have to worry about A, if I can get my money out, and B, you know, whether or not, um, you know, my, my, my livelihood is, is going to be safe. And, you know, I, I, again, having, you know, a lot of familiarity with Lebanon, I've seen cases where business people have come in, there, you know, there was a big controversy where a, an American company came in to develop the ports, and then after a, a, a while, somebody who, who was indigenous, you know, wanted a, a part of that, and, and essentially, you know, it, it was given over to the, the other company, and the American company then had the dilemma of figuring out where they were going to take it to court. Okay? And you know, this is a continual problem. If you end up doing international business, one of the important contractual aspects of what you do will be about where will the litigation take place? You know, where will you have to, and, and you know, in many of these countries, if you end up in the local courts, it's over. You know? Um, I used to have people tell me in Yemen, you know, they could literally sit and look at a list of uh, cases that were coming into the judicial system, and they would say, by looking at the last name of the person, they could say, that person will win, that person will win, that person will win. So, uh, when I was doing my research in Yemen, one of the things that I found is in, particularly in the rural areas, people were so mistrusting of the central government uh, that they they wouldn't even they would use more tribal local ways to resolve disputes um, and they would try to do their best <laughs> to avoid going through the central government because they they believed that it it was not going to work out for them and in fact when I went out I, I actually lived in a rural part of Yemen for about two years and when I went out there to to do my, my field work because I was doing a study on return migrants from Saudi Arabia. So I, I had had um, 
a lot of problems, first of all, getting permission and clearance to do research in Yemen at that time because they weren't letting <coughs> foreign researchers in the country because they didn't like what some of the foreign researchers had written about the country. And so um, it just so happened that at the time my supervisor at Oxford knew someone who was a poet who was from Syria and the head of education in Yemen happened to also be a, a poet and these guys used to get together and read poetry. So, um, you know, because I kept trying to go through the, the official channels and I was really getting frustrated and I'd already spent a lot of time on my, my theory and on my literature review and, and so this Syrian poet comes to see my supervisor and my supervisor says, well, I've got this doctoral student and she wants to go to Yemen to do some field work and she's having problems getting the research clearance and he says, okay, no problem. Next time I'm in Yemen and I see the head of education, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get her a note. So a couple months go by and this Syrian gentleman comes again to visit my supervisor and he's got this handwritten note, okay? Now, I took that hand note, written note at some point while I was doing my research because I was there about two years and I had it laminated because I didn't want it to get damaged because whenever I was in a pickle, and, and there were some few times, I would pull out this letter. And when they looked down and they would see his name and they would see it was written in, in, in his handwriting, uh, this gentleman that was the head, head of education at the time, they, they, they would then say, okay, you know, fine. So, you know, and, and when I started out in the capital and I was doing my research, you know, so I got, I got into the country and I started doing my research and then I had to go to the rural area and when I went to go to the rural area, I was sponsored by this uh, center, you know, research center there in Sana that was associated with, with the ministry. And when I went out to do my uh, field work, though, um, I brought the official letter and, uh, I, you know, I went to the head of the district and he was very nice because he was from the capital. But then I realized that the people, they were very suspicious and they were very suspicious of me. Okay, and of course, being an American, they were even more suspicious. They, you know, they instantly thought I worked for the CIA, you know, and um, or I was spying for Israel. They were not sure which one, but they knew it was one of the two. And um, so I said, you know, this this is not going well, you know. And uh, and of course, the guy from the ministry said to me, okay, well, you know, I'll help you. You know, I can get you, you know, in wherever you need to be. All right. Um, and so, you know, I said, well, you know, here are the people, here's the profile of the people I want to interview, you know. And, you know, he would bring me these people, you know, and, and they would be sitting in front of me and they'd be like shaking like this, you know. And, you know, I, I re instantly realized, you know, that they were lying on questions and stuff because, you know, what they were saying, you know, couldn't be correct. So I went back and I said to the, the guy in China, you know, you've you got to give me something else. I can't, I can't go out there, you know, and, and I can't win the trust of the people this way. Um, and I said, you know, can you give me a handwritten note? It worked to get me into this country. Maybe it'll work when I get out there. So, so I had him write a personal note to the guy out there in the district. And um, sure enough, he did the trick. You know, <coughs> After that, they stopped the surveillance me. They just let me kind of go on my way. And you know, after about 18 months of being out there, I used to have these guys, they'd walk up to me and they'd go, you know, um, you interviewed me for that uh, survey you're doing, and uh, well, I just want you to know I lied on this question and this question and this question, <laughs> you know. So, you know, again, it was all about trust. But unfortunately, you know, in systems where, you know, we, we get a lot more done, we can be more productive. And because we don't have to, our system doesn't have to rely on that kind of trust. We don't need to spend two years getting to know somebody to get them to tell us the truth, okay? Because we have laws in place and we have a rule of law and we have a judicial system that we trust to be equitable and fair, okay? And it doesn't mean that it's infallible. Of course, there's mistakes all the time made. There, but, but there again, there are, are, are ways that you can take your grievances, okay, and the way that, that you can act those grievances. And we can be quite open about our unhappiness with the system, and we have mechanisms that we can try to change the system, and I think that's important. You know, and, and in many of these countries, they don't have those kinds of mechanisms. And, you know, it's interesting also because in the 1990s, there were, you know, it was like, you know, the whole world opened up, it was globalization, and there was this idea that we started to realize, ah, these institutionals are bad. 
you know, channeling all the money into the government is bad because the, the money's not trickling down and you know the Kuznets theory is wrong and you know but we did another mistake so then we said okay institutions you know going through the government is not the right way let's regroup here and we'll go through civil society and um, you know I, I have to say I didn't ever get on the civil society bandwagon because it, it was it was this whole idea that you know oh all of a sudden we're going to give money to these smaller organizations and we're going to go around the government in these countries and we're going to fund NGOs you know non-governmental organizations and that's really what going to create you know a, a new paradigm well I remember going to Yemen in about 1995 <coughs> and and some of my academic friends at that point were actually doing really well. And they were saying to me, ah, this is great. I just started my own NGO. And, you know, the Dutch just gave me X number of dollars, you know. And, um, you know, all of these guys were just starting their own businesses. And particularly the ones that had been educated in the West. Why? Because they knew how to speak the language of the West. They knew how to write a grant proposal. And they knew how to put it in, in, in the, these forms. And I had a friend, a very close friend, who worked for the Ford Foundation in Cairo. And she later left because she got so frustrated and so exasperated because she tried to go and give money to people who were not as savvy, they were not English speakers, and um, they couldn't put together the proposal in the way that, you know, looked very nice, as, as it were. And they couldn't write up the, the, the you know, um, the counter to that. And, and yet, you know, they were people who were really at the grassroots that she believed could really make a difference. Um, and she had colleagues in the Ford Foundation who were also stationed in the Cairo office, and they were giving to these people educated in the West grand amounts of money, millions of pounds or dollars, and, um, you know, for these big projects that were being hauled out and, you know, put on the web in the U.S. and, you know, hailed as great successes. And she felt very frustrated because she just saw this as a, a, another form of this kind of corruption so it wasn't going to the state necessarily but it wasn't necessarily trickling down either so uh, it created then a rethink we said you know the state is important you can't go around the state the state's not dead it's important you've got to have good governance but you know you've got to start it at the central and and, and that was an important lesson I think that that the uh, international uh, community learned. Because it was that idea that you can put all the money, I can channel money right this moment into businesses in Yemen. But if those businesses cannot operate in a secure environment, if they cannot trust the laws, and they cannot trust the laws that are on the books, they're never gonna thrive, okay? So that's why it has to be in partnership with, with the governments. Um, we have to work within those systems, we have to help get the kinds of, of systems in place that, that, that will work. Then the whole notion of, you know, well, is aid then, you know, making the situation worse? You know, is it actually exasperating what's going on in these countries? Um, and, and there's really two mindsets out there about aid. One is that if you don't have good institutions, it's a waste. It's that garbage in, garbage out sort of idea. That you've got to work, you've got to get the structures in place. You've got to have a, a, a consistent rule of law. You've got to have leaders that are elected and put in place that people trust and that can create those institutions. That's one, one, one thought, okay? And needless to say, if I just do a strict economic analysis and I run the regressions, I will find that places that have better institutions and better institution structures have higher income levels and are, 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 are thriving and moving ahead. On the other hand, how do you get those institutions? You know, how, and that, that's really the, the million dollar question. How do you get the kinds of institutions in place so that can take place? So the second thought is, well, we can create those institutions. We can give aid, we can give support, and that aid and support will create uh, a, you know, the kinds of institutional structure that we need. So what we need to do then is give aid in a particular way. And there's been mixed results with this. So one is, and, and you know, Collier mentions this, where you, you give conditional aid. So you say, look, I'm gonna give you 
a thousand dollars or a thousand pounds and if you go out and you use it correctly and you turn it into a thousand one hundred pounds I'll give you two thousand pounds next time okay now in the total I'm gonna give you you know uh, uh, ten thousand pounds over the next five years but this is how I'm gonna give it to you okay and I have to see results so it's got to be result driven and, it, and it's got to make a difference the other thing is that you've got the whole idea of the World Bank IMF, okay? So, so there's that idea. How do we give aid? What kind of aid? Which aid works? Which aid doesn't work? And, you know, uh, you know I, I don't want to just say that aid doesn't work, because it does work. And it particularly works well in places that have good institutional structures. Where it doesn't work well is where the institutional structures are, are uh, this kind of client-based, where, where you've got a, a client and a patron. And the patron, you know, is the one who's got all the money, and they determine all the rules, and they decide who they give it to and how they give it to, okay? And um, so, you know, again, the institutions matter. With the IMF and the World Bank, it's another story. You know, a lot of people don't understand the IMF and the World Bank. Um, I, I find that if, if I say to, say to you right now, how many of you have heard of the World Bank before? I know I've talked just a little bit about it, so you, you hopefully have your hands up. Um, but the IMF and the World Bank were really created after World War II, and they're part of the Britain Woods system. They were created with the goal and the mandate to help uh, Europe, in particular, reconstruct itself after World War II and also get the global economy going again and particularly the financial economy going again. So what happened is that the IMF has a very particular mandate, and I find really that there's a huge amount of ignorance about what that mandate is. And that mandate for the IMF is that the IMF was created to make sure countries could balance their balance of payments. That's their mandate, okay? Because you have to realize that after World War II, when the Bretton Woods system was put in place, it was what we called a, a fixed exchange rate. And a fixed exchange rate system relies heavily in terms of movements on the balance of payments. And the balance of payments is all the money that comes in a country and all the money that goes out. It's an accounting statement that shows cash inflows and cash outflows for a country. So that the idea was that the IMF then was supposed to help countries balance their balance of payments. The World Bank was created to be the sister of the IMF. And as its sister institution, the IMF would come in as the bankers and they would make sure that your balance of payments is balancing. And if it's not, you could get money from them because to be a member of the IMF, you had to put money on deposit. And they would let you borrow back your money that you have. Now, if you still couldn't balance your balance payments and you needed to borrow more money, then you would start to get into what they call conditionalities. They would put in conditions for giving you the loan. Now, that's how the IMF works. The World Bank, how it works as the sister to the IMF, is it would give you loans to try to correct some of these structural problems in your economy that would help and lend to what the IMF was doing, okay? So those two organizations have to work together. Now the interesting thing about it is, is that most of what the World Bank and the IMF do today has to do with the bottom billion. It doesn't have to do with Europe or the United States. And in fact, the IMF ended up being uh, insufficient for the needs of reconstructing Europe. And that's why the United States created the Marshall Plan, okay? But the IMF, what's very interesting is also it was created because of the Britain Woods system, which was a fixed exchange system. Does the Britain Woods system exist today? No. Okay? We're on a floating exchange rate system. So what's very interesting is, like many institutions, the IMF has created a life of its own that really has very little to do with its origin. Okay? But its mandate has stayed the same. So when the IMF goes into a developing country, it goes in there to do what? Balance the balance of payments. Okay? 
because that's why it's been brought in. So when you want a loan from the IMF, when a country takes a loan from the IMF, they take it on the basis that they're in a deficit in their balance of payments. Now that deficit has a lot to do with the structure of their economy, of course, because if we're talking about all the goods that flow in and out of a country, we're talking a lot about trade, aren't we? And a lot of these bottom billion countries don't make enough for themselves. And in fact, some of them are very food dependent as well. So they're importing lots of goods. And when you import a lot of goods, that means you've got to have money going out. And so, uh, you know, they, they, and they have a lot of exchange rate issues. And so they've got much more money going out of their country and they're not necessarily producing anything. So they're not gaining any revenue from their exports. They're just essentially having to spend money on their imports. So that's how they end up running a balance of payment deficit. And that's how they end up at the doors of the IMF. Now, once they end up at the doors of the IMF, like I said, the first loan is easy money, second loan, conditionalities, and it keeps going on. Now, the other interesting thing that a lot of people don't know about the IMF and the World Bank is the IMF and the World Bank, and particularly the IMF, only give you a short-term loan. Because again, if you think about it, why do they give the loan in the first place? So you can balance your balance of payments. It shouldn't be something you keep doing over and over and over. So those countries that take loans from the IMF, they get a short-term loan. And then the next year, they run another balance of payment deficit. And they got to go back for another loan. And when they go back for another loan, though, they still haven't paid off the first loan. So they've got to keep, but they've got to pay off the first loan before they can get the second loan, because like I said, it's only a short-term lending process. So they've got to now take a bigger loan because they've got the first and the second one. Now you see what's happening over a, a number of years? You've got bigger and bigger loans. Each time you go back to the IMF, you've got to take a bigger loan because you have more unpaid debt because you consistently, year after year, ran a balanced payment deficit. And every year you keep going back, it becomes this relationship where you see the IMF and the World Bank they have to stay in business, and they have to look, and, and by the way, no one defaults on the World Bank and the IMF, okay? Um, they, they're, they, they turn a profit every year, and there's no defaulting, okay? There's rescheduling, but there's not defaulting. So they, it ends up into this cycle, and they, co they continue to put more conditions, and then, you know, if you don't meet the conditions, you don't get the money, and, but then on the other hand, if the IMF and the World Bank stop giving the money because you haven't met the conditions, then eventually they wouldn't seem like they have a very a purpose, right? So what happens then is that countries get into this little game with the IMF and World Bank, and that's why I call it a, a, a principal agent problem. Because what happens over time is I realize that if I don't do what the IMF tells me, they're going to give me the loan anyway, okay? And the reason they're going to give me the loan anyway, and even the World Bank is going to parade it as though it's a success, because they have to justify their being as an organization. Now, you know, so, so this is what has been going on now for years in these developing countries. And, and in the process, these countries have become so highly indebted that again, even if we change regimes, the, the regime that comes in afterwards inherits all this debt. And so, unless, you know, and, and just, you know, of course in the last decade we, we've gotten into a discussion about debt forgiveness and having, you know, countries or banks and organizations forgive the debt because that's the only way. I mean, it would be, you know, uh, like you, even if you got a really good regime and you get people who come into power but they're so strapped by debt and the accumulation of debt, how can they turn things around? How can they honestly make things better? And then, again, there's that, that idea that many of these countries have actually paid the debt off. They've paid the principal off many, many times. Now, the other thing is, then, that a lot of critics of the IMF World Bank say, well, look, the U.S. dominates the World Bank and IMF. Now, how many of you believe that's true? None of you believe that's true? <coughs> I do, all right, because it's true. The IMF and the World Bank do not work 
like the UN. It's not one country, one vote. The way they're set up is the person who pays the highest subscription rate gets the most say. So who do you think pays the highest subscription rate? Yeah. The US, okay, because it's based off the size of your economy, all right? And how much we keep a deposit. We dominate the IMF and the World Bank. It is the US agenda, 100%, okay? Don't fool yourself. Don't be polite just because I'm American, all right? It is our show, all right? It does not work like the UN. So the, the U, it, it's not only located in Washington, D.C., but the majority of, uh, uh, again, even the employees, the majority of employees uh, are economists and they are Americans. So that, um, you know, that often then leads to a feeling that much of what takes place, how lending takes place, you know, when, when, when of course the peso crisis happened and in Mexico, 24 hours bailout, okay? And, and again, there was a feeling that, well, because Mexico's on, on the border of the United States and it could have been very destabilizing for U.S. banks and the U.S. economy, okay? So there, there's those kinds of bigger issues. There's also the idea, as I said to you, kind of gets back to the Cousins model that was highly uh, criticized but was very much adopted for many, many years in the World Bank IMF. Um, and that narrow agenda that the IMF takes and, and the kind of mandate that, that creates that narrow agenda is sometimes seen as very counterproductive. And there are many cases where people have alleged, you know, the, the Asian financial crisis, you know, where pressure from the IMF and the World Bank to float exchange rates, a lot of the currency crises that we saw in the 1990s, people alleged were products of pressure from the IMF and the World Bank to float exchange rates um, and, and then led to crises. All right, so let's just quickly in the, the take about 10 minutes here and look at the case of, of, of Yemen because I know the case very well and it, uh, and I you know as I said it's, it's kind of the poster child for this bottom billion as it were. It's, it's a, a classic example uh, of, of one of these economies. So again, just uh, if we look at the numbers, uh, and we look at the, the poverty levels, of, and, and these are, are very conservative because these are official numbers, but I, I tend to always you know, put official numbers. Uh, but as you can see, uh, there's um, about half the population lives below the poverty line, and that, that's defined here as less than a dollar a day, okay? Um, you know, illiteracy <coughs> rates among women are 70%, so they, they're extremely high. Uh, life expectancy at birth is 63%. Uh, access to health service, only 55% of the population, and, and, and so forth. And you can see that you know, the, 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 the gross national income is about 1,060. And if we look at the breakdown of unemployment, it's about 35% for the overall population, but for youth unemployment, it's at 55%. So you can imagine then why many of the youth took to the streets, you know, because not, not a very uh, prosperous future they're looking at. <coughs> if we look at the key drivers, what makes Yemen a, a little more interesting, I think, than a, a typical third world country, and why I thought Yemen was a very interesting place to, to work on and, and write and do research, was because in the 1970s, 1980s, Yemen benefited tremendously by, from its neighbors becoming very oil rich. Uh, in the 1970s, after the oil crisis, when the, the Saudi Arabian oil industry was nationalized, and uh, they, they then started to develop their uh, country at, at a very fast pace, they needed uh, labor, and they needed unskilled labor. And so many Yemenis went into Saudi Arabia, and, and Saudi Arabia, uh, had pretty much an open door policy with North Yemenis in particular. And, 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 and again, at that point, Yemen was two countries. They were North and South Yemen for, for quite a while. Um, and North Yemen was much more aligned with Saudi Arabia, and so North Yemenis went in there. Now, what's interesting about that labor movement is during that period, there was people would go over and they'd work and they'd bring back. So the distribution of income was much wider. So. Um, actually, the 70s were a very good period in Yemen, and a lot of development, and, and a lot of 
uh, people being brought out of poverty because they could go and they work in Saudi Arabia and they could bring money back to villages. And there was uh, a, a lot of uh, local development taking place uh, within community. <coughs> However, of course, with the first Gulf crisis, uh, Yemen made a strategic mistake, uh, at least from, from a labor standpoint. And that was, it was just the unlucky moment for the Yemeni government. They happened to be sitting on the Security Council when the Iraq War started. And, um, you know, James Baker said at the time, it will be the most costly decision Yemen has ever made. Because Yemen <laughs> voted against the invasion in, in, in Iraq. And, um, and it was. If you look at the aid numbers and the grants, it literally dropped off to nothing. Okay? And the other thing was, um, and this is why my university friends all of a sudden became extremely poor, was up to that point, the, the government of Kuwait had sponsored higher education. So all their salaries, all the students, all the universities were, were, were paid by Kuwait. Now when they voted against uh, the, the, the invasion, uh, what do you think happened to the money from Kuwait? It was finished, okay? So, you can imagine then just what the situation was going in the 90s. Now, as dismal as all that was, lo and behold, Yemen had found oil. They, they started doing oil, at, um, you know, and extracting it in, in the late 1980s. And so, in the 90s, they go into a period then where they had uh, increases in oil revenues. But what did I tell you about oil revenues? They all get channeled to the government. So, they got an increased amount of oil money, now, all these people that are working in Saudi Arabia had had to come home, so you have about two million people that returned from Saudi Arabia, um, and these people had been sustaining their villages. They had been sustaining their families. So you can just imagine how decimated these communities were, and they were unable to really absorb these people. Um, and so, by the mid-1990s, so, lo and behold, incomes drop, things aren't good, what do you think happened? Civil war, okay? So in, uh, you know, in 1994, they had a civil war between the South and the North because they had unified just prior to that um, in 1990. Then they broke into a, to a civil war. Uh, they, they, it didn't, they didn't break back up. They stayed united, okay? But it was very costly. Oh, civil wars are always very costly. So now they ended up having to go to the IMF and the World Bank because their financial situation was very, very bad and they ended up with a, a, a structural adjustment program. So then the government continued to be sustained by oil money. Um, and, and yet, unfortunately, it was not trickling down. And, and the institutional structure developed was a very tribal-based society. Yemen is a very tribal-based society in the whole. But as uh, Saleh consolidated his, his leadership, he, he more and more stuck to his clan, as it were, in terms of putting people into kind of key positions. Um, and so this created a lot of threats and, and kind of bifurcation initially, and then eventually a split in, in, in kind of four different ways in Yemen. <coughs> so again, we see that, uh, you know, the kind of role of factors production in, in shaping the kind of relationship between the state and the market. And then also this, this idea of aid. Um, in the case of Yemen. So again, if we look at oil revenues, we can see that, um, you know, at, until here, now now again, some of these fluctuations have to do with oil prices, okay? <coughs> but you can look at the revenue stream and uh, from oil is, is the, essentially what has sustained the government. Now the other problem with rents, when rents come in and, and you don't have other major sources of income in a country, and the uh, rents go to the government. Unfortunately, what sometimes happens when you don't already don't have a structure and an institutional structure of good governance, it's as though the government can ignore the people. You see, when, you're, when your government needs your money, okay, they need you to pay your taxes, right? And if they need you to pay your taxes, you need to feel represented. You need to feel like you're getting something in return for your taxes. But if the government doesn't actually need your taxes, okay, and, and if getting money from you is going to create um, a, a, an expectation by you, then I can just ignore you, okay? 
And, and so that, that's what started to happen in Yemen. In the 70s and 80s, you had much more inclusive behavior by the state. But as you got into the 1990s, and as oil revenues drove the economy much more significantly, and you can see that in this graph here, you can see then that oil revenues, and, and you know again, you can see remittances, which are the returns from labor migration, still had some. There were still people. There are people in the United States. One thing about Yemenis is they're very good about giving money back, sending money back home. Um, so, although there were still some revenues, the revenues from uh, labor migration stayed flat, while those from uh, oil revenues <coughs> increased substantially. So the state and the economy, again, became a rentier state. So, now, of course, you've had regime change. You know, uh, Yemen recently, you know, was part, part of the, uh, the, the, these are the sons of Salah, who are also uh, very significant leaders within the military structure in Yemen. Uh, this is Hadi, who's the, uh, the, the, the present uh, president of Yemen, and that's Ali Abdallah Saleh, who was the, the former president of Yemen. Now, what we've seen is that, again, it's a classical example of what Collier describes, a, a, a kind of a structure where you have a, a very kind of institutional structure that, that on, the, on paper looks very similar to what, what you're familiar with, but in reality, it's a very much a client-based uh, structure that, that re revolves very much on uh, tribalism, on relationships, on uh, relationships with the ruler. And although they've had a change of regime, they haven't really had a change. So people feel very disappointed because although Ali Abdullah Saleh was pushed to the side in a very kind of clever way, uh, Hadi was his vice president. And um, he's the one who's come forward. And the interesting the thing about Hadi was that he's originally from the South, but even after uh, the, the Civil War of 94, he stayed on and worked with Salah. So he's not exactly seen as, as being a, an advocate for the South as well. So again, you have this kind of fragile state paradigm in the case of Yemen. This kind of notion of a state that's really on the verge of civil war. It's very fragile all the time. People in Yemen are extremely poor, and in fact, because there's no economic stability and there's no political stability, um, that it, it is actually, you know, you, you have, you know, there, there's now talk about the fact that there will be um, a famine in, <coughs> caused by literally the lack of income and food security. Um, and, you know, Yemenis are already very small, and uh, they're not small necessarily because of genetic reasons. It's malnutrition. Okay, their 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 growth is stunted because of the lack of access. Although in in many ways they should be the breadbasket of the Arabian Peninsula. They they've got very fertile land, um, but it, it's not being harnessed correctly. Um, okay, I think we're just out of time. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to I'm going to just finish this up next time. All right, and then we'll we'll start talking about technology and growth. All right, so do the readings, and I'll put these other articles up for you as well. And, and by the way, on your seminar on Monday, uh, they're going to tell you about what you're going to do for your presentation. Okay, so you can start thinking about that. All right, thank you. Thank you.